Hello and welcome back to Skypothesis. It's time for another Anniversary Edition build, and we are super excited to introduce you to the Phantom Blade. This no-crafting build has been a work in progress for nearly two years at this point, and it feels great to be able to finally share her with you all today. While the concept is fully doable in the vanilla game, the Anniversary Edition content like the Necromantic Grimoire and Gallows Hall really helped bring this build to new heights. Because siding with the Blades 100% requires making some questionable decisions, we thought it fitting to make a character that is quite evil and will lean into the Dragon Purge 100%. The Phantom Blade is a necromancer warrior who raises her recruited Blade companions as her own personal thralls in a twisted ritual. She is strictly utilitarian and believes that anything is acceptable, even the taking of innocent lives so long as it promotes the greater good. Through a combination of warrior skills and support spells, the Phantom Blade provided us with a fun twist on the normal necromancer tropes, and allowed for a more active style of gameplay. We also thoroughly enjoyed immersing ourselves in Blade's lore and into the mind of this disturbed warrior. As always, we've placed timestamps in the description to help you navigate between backstory, roleplay, gear, and more, but we hope you stick with us through the entire video. Be sure to check out our merch shop for sweet Skypothesis Antler Helmet logo swag, and join our Discord to hang out with like-minded roleplay fans. And now, without further ado, let's jump into our latest build, the Phantom Blade. Before the Septim Dynasty, before the Empire itself, the Seishis of distant Akavir invaded Tamriel. Wielding deadly katanas and harboring a lust for conquest, they advanced through the north, an unstoppable force. That is, however, until they faced Remon Cyrodiil at the Pale Pass in the Jural Mountains. Remon spoke to them with the voice of a Dova, and the Seishis halted. They ceased their conquest and swore fealty to Remon. They were the first to acknowledge him as Dragonborn, thus beginning the tradition of Dragonborn Emperors. Remon then founded an organization from these Seishi warriors, an order of dragon slayers known as the Dragon Guard. They fought bravely beside the Emperor on dragon hunts until eventually splintering off in disgrace after the assassination of Remon III. One of these splinter groups held on to their Akaviri heritage and became the Blades, swearing fealty to the man who had become Tiber Septim, the dragonborn they had been seeking for generations. The Blades served their dragonborn emperors with honor. Eventually, however, after the tumultuous sundering of the Septim dynasty, the Blades withdrew. Titus Mead was no dragonborn, so the Blades did not serve him. Instead, they withdrew to their temples and foresaw the looming threat of the Thalmor. The Blades fought tirelessly against the growing Aldmeri storm until the 30th of Frostfall, year 171 of the Fourth Era. A Thalmor ambassador delivered the severed heads of every Blades agent in the Somerset Isles and Valenwood, sparking the Great War. After the signing of the White Gold Concordat, the Empire virtually betrayed the Blades organization as a whole, allowing them to be hunted down one by one by the Thalmor. The Blades were driven nearly to extinction and hid in the frozen north, awaiting a dragonborn to guide and serve. While the remaining Blades waited in hiding, to the south, a young Imperial scout was sent north to Skyrim with intelligence about the Rebel Stormcloaks. She was a serious woman, occasionally insubordinate. Not because she didn't believe in the Imperial cause, but because she constantly thought that she knew better than her superiors. Since childhood, she held an air of superiority, and simply rolled her eyes when her parents reprimanded her for torturing squirrels and rabbits in the forest. Though her mind was quite disturbed, she knew the importance of the war and defending her home. Unfortunately, on her ride north, she disobeyed a direct order containing preferred route of travel, and wound up at the wrong place at the wrong time. Off the expected schedule, the Skyrim-based Legion officers thought her a Stormcloak spy. Like the Akaviri Dragon Guard of old, the Phantom Blade surrendered in the Pale Pass of the Jeral Mountains. Not far from the pass, Remon Cyrodiil used the voice to silence the advancing Seishi warriors. There is something poetic about the future Dragonborn and Blades warrior winding up in a nearly identical situation to the one that founded the Blades three eras previous. At this critical juncture, the Phantom Blade is mistakenly sent to the chopping block as a result of her insubordination. One would think that she would change her ways after being miraculously freed during a dragon attack, that she would shape up and admit that occasionally she is wrong, but the Phantom Blade does no such thing. Instead, her will hardens even further, and she becomes more convinced than ever that she can do no wrong, and it's all the others who are mistaken. With this in mind, we categorize the Phantom Blade as a neutral evil character. Though she may have good intentions, she doesn't care in the slightest how she gets there. She would slaughter a whole town in the name of defending her home. So when the dragons descend on Tamriel, she knows that they must be stopped. She advances through the main quest as quickly as possible. 
Upon discovering her identity as Dragonborn, she smirks. I always knew I was special, she says to herself, walking up the 7,000 steps after killing any foolish citizens who looked at her the wrong way. She finds that she strongly dislikes the Greybeards and their neutrality concerning the affairs of the world. If this world is to end, so be it. Let it end, Angir says. Seriously, Angir? She thinks. The Greybeards would stand by and watch Alduin devour the world simply because it is the natural way of things. No, she finds herself much more persuaded by the Blades, who, despite Delphine's occasional condescending attitude, quite literally revere her. She uses the Greybeards for their knowledge, but ultimately determines them useless and sides with the Blades 100%. Dragons are the ultimate threat to the world, and the Phantom Blade sees herself as a great hero, the only one who knows what is right, and the only one who can save the world. She becomes completely obsessed with dragon slaying and learning every shout she can. She admires Esbern, the Chronicler, in particular. He is valuable because he had the presence of mind to gather as much knowledge as he could before Cloud Ruler Temple was sacked. This sparks a zealous hoarding of knowledge, and the Phantom Blade decides to infiltrate the College of Winterhold to start siphoning its knowledge to boost the Blade's collection. She becomes adept at magic, specifically the illusion and restoration schools. Conjuration, however, intrigued her the most. She speaks to Phineas Jester at great lengths about the black art of necromancy. You mean to say, she says, a dead thrall will do my bidding without asking questions, without asserting their own opinions. Well, yes, Phineas replies, quite uncomfortable under the Phantom Blade's unblinking stare. However, I must recommend that you... But the Phantom Blade needed to hear no more. She seeks out necromancy on her own, in dark caves and vile caverns. She crosses paths with a shepherd of bone, tending to a farm with the aid of the undead, then eventually discovers Gallows Hall, south of Windhelm. Tucked away near a festering pond, the Phantom Blade discovers the Staff of Worms, the legendary staff wielded by Mana Marco, the greatest necromancer to ever live. She recalls Delphine's invitation to bolster the ranks of the Blades, and her mind hatches a plan. Rather than leading strong-willed Nords with their own opinions into battle, she could simply lure strong warriors to Skyhaven Temple, make them swear fealty to the Blades organization, who in turn swear fealty to her, the Dragonborn. She sees no issues in slaughtering them right then and there and raising them up to be her undead servants. They never ask questions, they never say no. Perfect warriors for the perfect slayer of dragons. You can recruit almost every follower in the game to the Blades. When you do so, they will receive a full kit of Blades armor and a Blades sword and shield. While you are normally unable to change the clothes of a dead NPC before raising them, as when you fast travel they will revert to their regular garb, joining the Blades faction resets their base armor, and raising them from the dead will keep them in their Blades armor permanently. With the Twin Souls perk you can raise two Blades Thralls, and have a third standard living follower, totaling a party of four warriors decked out from head to toe in Akaviri gear. You can choose whoever you want for your Thralls. We chose Lydia, as she is already proficient in heavy armor and one-handed, and Aeola, the priestess of Namira. She is a Nightblade, but uses necromancy as well, so when your team gets going, she has potential to grant you with even more undead followers. Plus, we thought it was perfectly in character for the Phantom Blade to go through the whole Namira questline solely for the reason of gaining Aeola's trust, just so she could kill her in Skyhaven Temple and raise her as a thrall. Other character builds may have qualms about such blatant evil, but the Phantom Blade doesn't even bat an eye. She's utilitarian, and what she does simply makes sense to her. Why would she do it any other way? Keep in mind that you can raise thralls up to level 40, so it may be a good idea to adventure for a while with each one before killing them and raising them, giving them time to level up. We roleplayed this as the Phantom Blade testing their mettle and valor, ensuring that they would truly be the perfect thralls. For the third living companion, we wanted a hardened mercenary who wouldn't ask questions. Someone who could fight next to the Phantom Blade and her thralls and didn't care, so long as they were paid. We landed on Janasa, the Dark Elf, recruitable right out of the gate in the Drunken Huntsman in Whiterun, as she fit the bill perfectly. Teldrin Sero from Ravenrock is a functionally superior choice, but when you recruit him to the Blades, he loses all of his unique dialogue, and we thought that was too much of a shame to do. Killing Parthenax is a quest moment that most players, including ourselves, actively avoid. Parthenax is, in our opinion, one of the greatest characters in The Elder Scrolls, period. This is one of the main reasons why we feel it's hard to build a morally good character that leans 100% into the Blades faction in Skyrim. The Phantom Blade feels no remorse in slaying him. To her, he's just another Dova to put down. 
As her story progresses, however, the Phantom Blade finds that killing just dragons isn't enough. Killing all of the dragon priests, as well as stopping Mirak, becomes a mission of the Blades as well. She joins the Dawn Guard in an attempt to rid the world of vampires as she sees them as an equal threat to the dragons. Again, everything she does is to protect the world even though she goes about it in horrible, horrible ways. Though she cares little what others think, she still takes time to re-kill and dismiss her thralls outside of populated areas, as wandering through towns with their constant moaning and freaked out NPCs isn't all that fun. Now let's move into creating the character. She will wear an armor combination that we call Phantom Blades Armor, that combines Blades Armor and gauntlets, studded dragon scale boots, and the Ascendant Necromancer Hood. The Blades Armor is obtainable upon reaching Skyhaven Temple in the main quest, and the studded dragon scale boots can be obtained right out of the gate at the end of the Anniversary Edition quest Tilted Scales, which can be started by reading the book The Crimson Dirks Volume 4 in Candlehearth Hall in Windhelm. The Ascendant Necromancer robes and hood begin to spawn in Necromancer dungeons starting at level 46 and grants an additional 100 magicka. Until then, you can snag an identical looking masked Necromancer hood in the throne room at the end of the Ingvild Nordic Ruin on the island northeast of Dawnstar. The quest Toying with the Dead sends you there to retrieve Necromancer journals, and we found that to be a great entry point for her into the dark art of necromancy. We definitely recommend using this hood for the aesthetic until you reach the point where you can find an Ascendant variant for the Magicka bonus. For Auxiliary gear, she will wear the Sovereign Band, a custom ring added with the creation Arms of Chaos. It fortifies your Magicka by a whopping 50 points and adds a 10% faster regen bonus. She will also wear a leveled amulet of Fortify Restoration so that she can more easily support her squadron with healing spells. For weapons, she will dual wield blade swords, swapping out one of them for Dragonbane when fighting dragons. Goldbrand is an option as well, as it is indeed a katana, but where it doesn't directly have ties to the blades, we didn't use it all that much in this playthrough. She will also situationally use Dawnfang and Duskfang, the Seishi forged Akaviri artifact, obtainable during the Creation Club quest A Soul Divided. This unique blade has two forms, transforming during sunrise and sunset, and dealing fire or frost damage respectively. Each day you can recharge the blade by killing, and after 12 kills, unlock a health absorbing effect that grows stronger until the next sunrise or sunset. The Phantom Blade is drawn to Donfang and Duskfang because of its Seishi origin, and occasionally goes on killing sprees to charge it up before a dragon encounter. She will also carry the Staff of Worms, again for the broken ability to raise a thrall with minimal magicka investment. Moving on to spells and shouts. Her primary spell casting will revolve around the Illusion and Restoration spells. It felt quite strange for us at first to be playing as a necromancer with minimal perk investments on Conjuration, but the Staff of Worms makes this possible. This opens up a world where, even at lower levels, you can support a powerful undead army. Like many of our previous videos, we like to keep our spell selection simple. This helps with the gameplay flow and helps us avoid character builds becoming too similar to each other. From the Restoration School, the Phantom Blade will primarily cast Necromantic Healing, Heal Other, Close Wounds, and Greater Ward. Necromantic Healing is found in Dim Hollow Crypt, just past where you first meet Serana. It's tucked away on a table near a chest and is an absolute staple for this build. Greater Ward is included specifically to counter Dragon Breath attacks, and should be used in the opposite hand of Dragon Bane. Ward spells just look really really cool during Dragon Combat, and they are fitting for a focused Dragon Slayer. Her primary illusion spells will be either Rally or Call to Arms, depending on the situation. Both spells, when coupled with the Master of the Mind illusion perk, will be able to buff your whole party, with Call to Arms improving their combat skills, health, and stamina for 10 minutes. For Shouts, the Phantom Blade will frequently use Elemental Fury, Battle Fury, Disarm, Dragon Rend, Marked for Death, Unrelenting Force, and Whirlwind Sprint. Alright, moving on to stats and perk spread. We leveled the Phantom Blade with a ratio of 2 in Magicka and Health for every 1 in Stamina. She will need a large Magicka pool for her Restoration and Illusion support spells, but luckily not for raising her thralls. Later in game when you are able to obtain an Ascendant Necromancer Hood, you will probably be able to switch solely to upgrading health. For her Standing Stone, we will be using the Lord Stone to increase her tankiness and give her base magic resistance, helpful for getting up close and personal and leading the charge. Finally, we are playing as an Imperial. While this is primarily for the roleplay, the instant zero magicka cost pacify spell of Voice of the Emperor helps in her ritual killings, and is fun to roleplay as her commanding hypnotic presence. By the time you reach level 40, you will want the following perks. In one-handed, take all five in Armsman, Fighting Stance, Savage Strike, Critical Charge, 
both in Dual Flurry and Dual Savagery. In Conjuration, take Novice Conjuration, Necromancy, Dark Souls, and Twin Souls. Again, with the ridiculously overpowered Staff of Worms, we have no need to work up to the Master Perk here. In Restoration, take Novice through Adept, Dual Casting, Regeneration, Respite, and Necromage. These perks are particularly useful for the spell Necromantic Healing, as Regeneration makes the relatively weak spell 50% more effective. Respite allows the spell to restore your thrall stamina, and Necromage further boosts the healing. In Illusion, we will be perking the entire tree. While we will primarily be casting support spells, manipulating the battlefield with Fear, Calm, and Frenzy spells are equally effective. In Archery, take 3 in Overdraw, Eagle Eye, and 1 in Steady Hand. Though Archery does take a backseat to melee combat, she needs the flexibility to be effective at both range and close quarters combat. Since she commands a party of 4, she knows the right situations to lead the charge, and when it's best to support her team from a distance. If you plan to play past level 40, digging into some of the crafting skills would be quite useful. Smithing would be a useful skill to spec into to temper your blade swords and armor. Enchanting and alchemy could further boost your raw damage output as well. As it stands though, the Phantom Blade is a fully functional no crafting build and that always feels pretty neat if you're sick of grinding up enchanting. Additional perks for the Phantom Blade to acquire are Companion's Insight, obtainable at the end of the black book Winds of Change. This perk is a must-have for builds with followers, as it makes your shouts and spells do no damage to followers. Seeker of Sorcery is another black book ability found at the end of the Sallow Regent, which gives you a 10% cost reduction for all spells. Sailor's Repose, which adds a 10% healing bonus to healing spells, including necromantic healing and Dragon Infusion, adding a permanent 25% damage reduction from Dragon's melee attacks. You will also want to frequently obtain Dragon Slayer's Blessing from Esburn, which lasts 5 days and grants you 10% increased critical hit chance versus Dragons, though due to how weak critical strikes are in Skyrim, this is mainly done for roleplaying purposes. Alright, moving on to our favorite part of every build, the special moves. In this section, we create move combinations that help gameplay feel unique to this specific character build. The Phantom Blade's moves focus on buffing her party, as well as enhancing her natural warrior abilities. First up is Seishi's Dance, performed by first shouting Disarm, then hypnotizing them with the Imperial ability, Voice of the Emperor. Voice of the Emperor is by far the most powerful pacify effect, as it works against enemies up to level 99, higher than any found in the game. Use this ancient dance to nullify powerful enemies and render them helpless and dazed before your army of blades. This is an effective way to charge the enchantment of Dawnfang and Duskfang, the Seishi Blade of old. Up next is Choke Point, which is the combination of Bardic Knowledge, Whirlwind Sprint, and Dual Wield Power Attacks. Use this move to flank enemies by sprinting to the other side of the battlefield, sandwiching the enemies between your minions and your blades. Bardic Knowledge regenerates stamina, allowing you to unleash an unending flurry of steel. The Phantom Blade learned this move from an Orc Necromancer, a Shepherd of Bone whose connection to her raised dead was unparalleled. Up next is Akaviri's Conquest. This is the ultimate power-up dragon slaying move for your party. It combines Battle Fury, Call to Arms, Dragon Infusion, and Dragon Slayer's Blessing. When a dragon lands, it will be met with the force of three Call to Arms Enhanced Blades, one Living Blade Companion with increased attack speed, and their leader with powerful blessings from the Blade's Chronicler. When you execute this move, even legendary dragons don't stand a chance. With the dark power of necromancy, the Phantom Blade becomes the ultimate dragon slaying force. And with that, we are ready to wrap up this build video. Necromancers are always fun, but we often find ourselves bored with support mages who must rely too much on the minion's AI throughout the game. The Phantom Blade is a warrior first, necromancer second, and this up close and personal combat style was an absolute blast. It's also very difficult for us to side with the blades and kill Parthenax, but roleplaying as an evil twisted character made with a singular purpose of dragon slaying made that choice possible and believable. All in all, we are very happy with how this build turned out and hope that you all have fun playing as her. We have more anniversary editions coming your way, so keep your eyes to the skies. Thanks for helping us keep the magic of Skyrim alive. We'll see you next time, right here on Skypothesis.